Thank you everybody for joining us on another Tiny ML Talk. Today we'll be listening to Dr. Fadi Al Salim's talk on ML using microelectronic electromechanical systems or MEMS. We'd like to thank our Tiny ML strategic partners for committing to take Tiny ML to the next level together. Analog devices, Aeon devices, ARM, Deep Light, Edge Impulse, Emza Visible Sense, Photo Hub, Greenwaves Technologies, Gravity Inc., HOTG, ImageMob, Itemis, Clica Tech, Latent AI, Noda AI, NXP, Prophecy, Kixo, Qualcomm, Reality AI, Reekson Technology, Renesas, SAP, Seed Studio, Sensi ML, Sony Semi Semiconductor Solutions Corporation, ST, Stream Analyze, Synaptics, Syncense, and Sentient. Our next Tiny ML Trailblazer series is Success Stories with Mona Al Khatib, CEO, CTO, and co founder of Aeon Devices, is live online on June 7th at 8 a.m. Pacific time. Register now by scanning the QR code on this slide. Also join the growing tiny ML communities online on our meetup group or in our LinkedIn tiny ML community by scanning the QR codes here. We have over 9.7 thousand members in the meetup group and 2.8 thousand members in the LinkedIn group. Also subscribe to this tiny ML YouTube channel for updates and notifications, including this video that will be uploaded after the talk at youtube.com slash tiny ML. Today's speaker is Dr. Fadi Al Salim. Dr. Al Salim joined the College of Engineering at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, UNL in August, 2016. Before this assignment, he worked for multiple years in the industry, including four years as a senior lead algorithm engineer at Emerson Electric, Electric Inc. to develop novel cloud-based sensor monitoring and learning algorithms used for fault diagnostics for mechanical systems. His current and future potential research goals are to vertically advance the fields of intelligent wearable sensing technologies and artificial intelligent algorithms and their use in many health and medical applications. In this research area, he has more than a 10 awarded patents, more than 100, 100 publications, presentations, and invited talks, and over 6 million total, near 1.5 million to his research team of active funding to support his research work. And my name is Jenny Plunkett, and I'm a senior developer relations engineer at Edge Impulse. Um, and Dr. Al Salim, please get started. Thank you. Thank you. For joining us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction here. So yeah, my name is Fadi Al Salim. My talk is about like the research I've been doing for the last few years about how to use sensor to do machine learning. You know, so it's kind of interesting research area. And the main objective of that uh, kind of research is, you know, as you guys know, like uh, those small devices, like such as wearable device, are no longer tolerate much power processing. You know, there's a lot of application, there's a lot of potential, but the bottleneck for those application is the power. You know, you, you do need to charge your, your wearable device that often. So how, how to solve this problem, how we kind of achieve this, like for the first time now we're doing machine learning in the MEMS substrate level, like in the, in the physical layer. So there's no even sometimes need for distal processing to do this machine learning. So how that might change things? Yeah, as I mentioned, like this kind of, enabled for the first time machine learning to be done at the physical layer of the sensor. So it will eliminate the need for uh, like the energy hungry circuit to perform machine learning and will enable like a uh, sophisticated algorithm to go in wearable device without the need for, for, for charging that often. So this schematic here shows kind of this kind of new paradigm of how to do things. So you can see like uh, there's no longer the concept where, you know, you need to measure your, like, uh, you will see through the, the presentation, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about acceleration, but the same can apply for other types of sensor, but the focus here on acceleration. So the way it's done now in the literature is you have accelerometer, and then you want a single condition that acceleration measurement, and then send it to DSP or my control to do machine learning. And then the new work we're doing now, there's no that concept, there's no digital computer, just you put the, a network of sensor, and you connect them together to perform machine learning in the spot. And again, we'll walk you through an example of how, how this can change the literature about doing machine learning in, in, in smart devices. So 
Yeah, first of all, I want to kind of acknowledge my team, especially Dr. Sebash from Texas, Dallas, University of da Texas at Dallas, Dr. Rosby from Texas a and uh, their graduate students, and also my graduate st uh, student team. And finally, to my BST advisor, Dr. Muhammad Yunus. So this is kind of kind of some everything here. Like this is kind of my key slide here. It shows what's been done now, what we've been doing in the, in the past and where we are now. So, and again, because this is a very important slide, you will see I'll come back to each part of this slide. But, but in general concept, you know, to the left, if this is how a sensor work. And again, I'm using the accelerometer as an example. You have an accelerometer, it experiences acceleration, it produces a voltage, and then this voltage will be amplified. And then, you know, so you can process the data of that accelerometer, you need ADC, and then you send it to CPU. It, it could be a DSP, it could be a microcontroller, and then you want to perform some machine learning. So this is, has been done, what's been done in the literature, and there's a lot of bottleneck here. First of all, you need uh, OB amps, you need ADC and all that. So back like 10 years back ago, I said like, you know, for application where you're really only interested to know if the acceleration exceeded a certain threshold value, then we can design what we call a mechanical switch. Again, I'll talk more about this. The problem with this switch, it's only, it works, but only works for application where you only care about the amplitude. But how about if you like, you know, as, as you look at the last part here, how about if you wanna like do more, more things? For example, like, you know, I wanna know if there's, um, uh, you wanna know like if there's, beside the amplitude, I worry, I worry about the duration. What happened before, what happened after? And then, you know, the, the cost of machine learning kick in, how we can handle them. And in the middle, this is kind of mainly by my collaborator at the University of Texas, Dallas, they kind of figure out a way where, you know, an accelerometer, an array of them, they can be arranged in a way where, you know, will act as a switch and their switch value will represent the binary code of the acceleration. So this is a big thing, yeah, right? So rather than dealing with other, uh, with other signal that you want to ADC it, now those network can produce an already digital format. The problem with that, if you want to do some machine learning, still you want to need a CPU. So the work I'll be talking about today is this is the far right here, how we can do everything together, you know, how we can perform machine learning without the need for CPU. So before coming to this, to this kind of where, where the, the talk of this presentation, I'll walk you through about what having been done before, before we reach that point. So our next slide, you know, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the accelerometer, but I just decided to just talk quickly about that. So. It was back in the early of last century where people realized there's no longer need to have those big accelerometers to do acceleration. The big thrill was how to shrink those very small so they can do acceleration. But as I said before, the main change with those, those will reduce a low voltage. You need, you need to op amp it, you need to ADC it, and you need a CPU to process the data. And you know, I'm sure also most of you know how a typical accelerometer work, but I, I thought still this slide might be helpful. You know, it's a proof mass that vibrate, the vibration can be related to the acceleration, as simple as that. Now, as I said before, the next step for our team, we said for application that we only care about the mag magnitude of the of acceleration, we design what we call a mechanical uh, threshold acceleration switch. So without going much detail, the way we, we design it, we just, you know, means at the end of the day are microstructure. Like think about clam clam or cantilever beam for the one who knows structure. So we design those structure so they can collapse with the substrate and act as a switch if a certain acceleration has ex exceeded uh, a certain threshold. So the, the beauty about this approach, you know, is a very simple approach where, you know, think about the airbag system in the car, where you really care about if the acceleration exceeds the threshold to fire the airbag. In this simple kind of uh, prototype, you know, you don't need a control unit. You don't need uh, an ADC to, to kind of sample the acceleration to decide if I'm exceeding a threshold. It's just a pure mechanical device that by itself will, will click and make that switch if the acceleration has been ex exceeded a threshold. As simple as that. The issue with this, as I said at the beginning, this works only if the application is about the amplitude. But how about if you want to look at other parameters before you decide the signal? This will not work. 
between this and the thing we, we're doing now, you know, this work, very interesting work by my collaborator at the University of Dallas at Texas, they kind of arrange those uh, accelerometer threshold switches in a way where, like, you, if you want to realize, let's say, like a three bit distal accelerometer, you need three switches. And then you couple them in a way, in a mechanical way, where they will kind of represent the, the binary code of acceleration. And actually, recently they did that, my understanding, for up to seven bits or even eight bits. So you have eight bits of those switches, and their state of zeros and one will be based on the applied acceleration. The beauty about this approach, then you don't need to ADC the signal. You already get a digital version of the of the acceleration without the need for ADC. The problem with this one, if you want to do machine learning, you still want to send it to CPU and process the data. So how's the solution? What's the solution to all, all those challenges? So what we figured out is, you know, in nutshell, like we were able for the first time to put those MEMS device, which they usually use as an accelerometer, we put them together, we connect them, and I'll talk about how we can connect them in a way they can perform machine learning at the spot. Yeah, before talking more about this, let's kind of just step back and try to review what machine learning and how we approach this, how we arrive to this approach. So long story short, you know, our neurons in the brain are very complex. So if you look at this chart here, let me see, use my again laser spot here. So this is kind of how, this is how uh, our neur neuron reacts. You know, we have billions of those in our brain. So it's very complex. In 1963, there's, I think, two guys, they, they make a breakthrough where they were able to describe those neurons in our brain by differential equation. The problem with that, this is very complex equation. There's a lot to it. And think about when I describe one neuron in our brain, it takes that kind of complexity. So the breakthrough comes somewhere after that where people realize what's important actually is not the, the spike. We call those the spike of the neuron. What's more important is the pattern, the frequency of those spike. And guess what? The frequency of the spike is what kind of correspond to the learning in our brain. And good news, this can be described by a single differential equation. So all those complexity, you can substitute it by this very simple ordinary uh, differential equation that describes the rate of the neuron, how many spikes you have per minute or per second. And again, neuroscience, they find this is what really matter for our learning in the brain. So that's kind of the big truth. Like rather than using all those complex equations to describe one neuron in our brain, we will figure out this simple equation. But guess what? This equation is still, if you want to use digital computer to solve, it's not easy because you have differential equation. And think about for a typical machine learning, the way it works, you should have multiple of those neurons. They are coupled together when I solve them at the same time. So yeah, differential equation is not fun with digital computer. So, you know, as usually people do, what the, the trick they do, they do kind of difference equation. So you still get the essence of that, but you lose up a lot of power from that representation. So I'm not sure you're familiar with that, but there's a still a uh, concept called CTRNN. So I know a lot of people, they kind of familiar with RNN. CTRNN is current continuous recurrent neural network where you, need to, you, you want to use a differential equation to describe the neuron in each of this machine learning. RNN is you want to use differential equation, which a lot of people do with digital computer. But, but think what? If we were able to describe those CTRNN with the hardware, then there's a lot of power we can utilize from that. So this is exactly why I did. You know, without going much detail, the MEMS, you know, the MEMS dynamic is very complex. When we use them as a sensor, we always start to avoid that complexity by exciting them slowly. So we only run in the linear regime. But guess what? If you excite them to the full potential, you get this very complex kind of behavior. And guess what? With some work, with some engineer, some engineering, we can make that equation similar to the CTRN equation. So that's a big thing. So think about now the MEMS, when it vibrates, rather than give us the acceleration, we can engineer it to, to solve this complex machine learning neuron that we will shy away because it, it has differential equation. So honestly, this is the, the kind of the whole thing. If we can engineer the MEMS that can kind of measure acceleration, but at the same time, 
it's movement with slow um, machine learning, then there's no need for a computer to do that. So in, a, in another word, what, we be, what we're doing now is we kind of fabricate, we kind of design those MIMS rather than having one MIMS to measure acceleration. You look here, we have one MIMS here, one MIMS there, at least we have three MIMS here, but then we couple them together. So they, we arrange them in a way when they move, simultaneously they are measuring acceleration, but at the same time they, they're kind of performing machine learning because their movement, their movement is the differential equation that describes the, the MEMS neuron equation. So again, I'm repeating myself again and again, there's no need for a computer to calculate the machine learning equation. It's done in the spot. And one advantage, advantage performing CTRN user hardware, it's very known in the literature. If you're using a machine learning based in differential equation, the complexity of differential equation eliminate the need for many neurons to solve the same problem. This is from the literature for the same problem that you wanna kind of classify your hand just like what you try to do with your hand. You need, if you wanna use an RNN, which is based on the diff difference equation, you need at least 128 neurons. If somehow you're able to, to perform the network with a theta RNN, which again, use the differential equation, you only need four neurons to do it. So that's a gain. If, but again, the problem with this computer is very hard to solve to solve differential equation. Now we're using the MEMS to solve that. So that's a big gain for us. Now, the question is like the, the SSC question, okay, so this is, sounds interesting, the concept using MEMS to do machine learning, but the bottleneck, how you wanna do coupling? How wanna couple those MEMS together? And think about the coupling here, the physical coupling is the weight. When you train a machine learning, a typical machine using Python or MATLAB, there's a weight. How we can translate that weight concept to the MEMS hardware? So, so far we've been investigating at, le at least three, three methods to do the weight. So I'll start with the easy one. The easy one, very straightforward. It's just mechanical coupling. So again, for the one who's very familiar with MEMS, so this is a proof mass. This is a proof mass that measure acceleration. This is a proof mass. So you can see there's a mechanical stiffness that connect this proof mass to that proof mass. The same thing, there's a mechanical stiffness that co connect this proof mass to other mass. So think about if there's an acceleration that applied to this network, each mass will move its own way, but since they are, have mechanical coupling, they will affect each, each other. And you know, the same concept that when you train a machine learning to have different waves, we can have different stiffness. Visually, you can see you have more springs here than that. So this means we have different stiffness that couple this mem to that mem. And literally, this is the weight. This is the weight you, you guys calculate for typical machine learning for using Python code. We do it mechanically by having different stiffness coupling between the mems. So that's the first way to do the coupling. It's very straightforward. The problem with it, it kind of scales very well because you always want to have mechanical coupling between the mems. So there's that much you can do. You can do maybe five, you can do six, but there's no way you want to make 100 of those MIMS coupled together mechanically. So what's the other approach? A very kind of interesting approach, what we call it using the finger. You know, for the one who is familiar with electrostatic MIMS, there's a way to actuate them use what we call calm dry fingers. So one way to achieve the coupling is, if you look at this, I, I took one of the masks by itself, but you can see there's a set of fingers that is, powered by other MEMS. So anytime the other MEMS, so for example, MEMS number two. So I have here MEMS I is the MEMS or neuron of interest. So think about V2 is coming from MEMS two. So anytime MEMS two is sending a signal that I'm active, please apply to MEMS I. There's a set of fingers that will be powered from MEMS two and will be activating, activated over MEMS I. Same thing will be from MEMS1, same thing from VN. And you can see this can scale way much better than the mechanical concept because there's no mechanical contact. It's just like you have a set of fingers that would be powered by other MEMS. So this is kind of um, a sim, uh, an SEM image of this concept, utilize this finger. You can scale it very well because it's all about the fingers, how much fingers you can put for that MEMS. 
And we demonstrate this can do uh, a good job compared to the mechanical coupling. Now the question is, can I do hundreds? Can I do more? The answer is yes. So the other part of the coupling is kind of typical coupling using ob amps. You know, so you will have an ob amps that will transfer charge from one mint to other mint. And you know, the constant of the weight is very obvious here because you can uh, kind of select the gain for each uh, of and to transfer uh, voltage from one MIMS to other MIMS. So this is kind of the, 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 the third way to do it how, using of amps. So between mechanical stiffness, uh, comb drive fingers to of amps, those are the three methods that you can achieve the coupling between the MIMS to produce the machine, machine learning computing uh, using only MIMS devices. So all with that, so can we do a computing? And the answer, yes, we were able to demonstrate uh, this concept of MIMS computing in different application. And the big thing here, we're doing machine learning without the need for any processing unit. It just only sensor. I'm keep repeating that, but this is the key thing. And one thing to emphasize again, 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 and again, the, the MIMS itself to major acceleration, like the MIMS itself consume very, very little power. This is a capacitive device. It's only like maybe nano or even microwatts power. So there's no need for ADC. There's no need for op amps and all that. So and imagine also dust computing. So those devices can consume nano or even microwatts just to produce computing. So the first application we target is a very kind of common application in the literature. Imagine you have what we call a triangle and a square, square, square signal. And you, know, you want to devise a machine learning that can discriminate between those two signals. So it's, this is a kind of textbook uh, problem in the literature. It's been done, it's been solved, but most of the time using this as a computer. You do the training, you, know, you bring a network, you train it, and then you do the training and you solve it. Now, for the first time, we are doing this using a MEMS. There's no need any computer. So, so again, there's a lot to this slide, but this, the same network I showed you before, it's only made from three MIMS, and those MIMS are coupled together, and we carefully select the weights between them so that when you apply a triangle signal, the, the upper mass will, will go and hit its substrate here, indicating I detect uh, a triangle signal. When you apply a square signal, then we design the network in the such that this lower mass will go uh, and, and hit the substrate in the other way. So based on the shape of the signal, either one of the mass will be up or the other mass will be down. And you know, one thing I want to kind of emphasize here and again, and again, besides the power consumption to be low, this is the first time constant machine learning where those devices will sense the acceleration and simultaneously will do the computing. No one did this before. We're doing, think about this is acceleration signal. This is no longer like a, a voltage or something. This is acceleration signal. You apply it directly to the MEMS and the MEMS themselves, you tween them based on the coupling weights, they can decide if this is a square triangle. Very basic example, but this it showed the powerful of this method. There's no need for any Mac person to do this computing. There's a lot to it, but this is kind of ma the major idea where if you apply a triangle, you will have different switching. If you apply square, you have the other way of switching. Okay, that is, that's good. Can we do more? So the next application we target is kind of a physical application. So somebody might ask, okay, this look trivial. You have like a square and triangle. I can run a Python code very quickly and do the, the computing the same way. But we took it one, one level above. And we try to think about what a real life example, what's kind of the most common use for wearable device, as you might all know, is the activity recognition. You know, you want to design your wearable device, your Fitbit or other watch or whatever is that, that you want to know if somebody's walking, if somebody's jumping, if somebody's sitting. I see somebody in the chat, let me see if there's any question before I... Oh, uh, there's an issue here. Okay, so it's just more about the sound. Yeah. Yeah, please, if there's any question, let me know so I can stop and answer those questions. Otherwise, I'll just keep going. 
So one kind of a typical application we target is active ego recognition. Can we, can we design, can we tune this network, this physical network, this MIMS network, this mechanical network to, to decide if somebody's walking, if somebody's sitting, if somebody's jumping? And the answer was yes. So to the, to the right here, I'm gonna use my laser here. So here is kind of typical profile you can get for somebody standing to sit or sit to stand. This kind of complete different behavior, you know, between sit to stand and stand to sit. So again, this is the acceleration profile. We just use a typical accelerometer to measure your acceleration. And you, as you can tell, you can simplify this profile as two different shape of signals. One is kind of a triangle that's going up and then down, or the, like the, to sit to stand is the other way. You have the same kind of triangle shape, but kind of reverse. So can we design this MEMS hardware to, to kind of to decide if somebody sit to stand or start to sit? And the answer is yes. We train, we change the weights between those MEMS devices to do this classification using only MEMS without the need for any microprocessor. Again, there's a lot to this and how we tune those, how we kind of, kind of design this. But the, but the main idea is if, we, if, the, if, the, if the signal is for the set to stand, then similar to what we had before, we design, in, in this case, the, the middle mass is the key, the key guy here. If this, if this signal received, then the middle mass will go and hit its upper kind of substrate, indicating I'm, I'm detecting the, the, the sit to start the sit to start signal. Otherwise, if the signal is start to sit, then the middle mass will go and hit its, its bottom stopper, indicating I'm, de I'm detecting a different signal. So the same argument I said before, it's only mechanical device with nanowatt range, they do the same at the same time, they measure the acceleration, but at the same time they do computing. They decide what type of signal is there. Am I sitting to stand or sit to, or standing to sit? Without the need for ADC, without the need for OBM, without the need for microprocessor. They do this in the spot. They're doing this in the spot uh, in the in the MEMS in the MEMS dynamic response. So again, this is there's a lot to it, but those pictures should confirm that if you apply the sit to stand, then you see the middle mass will go touch its upper bound. If you apply the, the stand to sit, then the middle mass will go and touch the lower bound. And each of those signals is enough to, to decide what kind of activity I'm seeing now in this applied in this network. Can we do more? And the answer is yes, and yes, and yes. In this example, it's only a simulation level. We wanna, the next thing you wanna move that to the hardware, we're able, we're able to kind of uh, use a MEMS network that can decide a lot of activity, not only sit to stand, standing, sitting, walking, jumping, and even like when you say it's like different mechanism of sitting to stand, stand to lie, lie to stand. So we have maybe 10 different activity. And guess what? With only MEMS, so this chart, that's what we'll show here. With only MIMS, there's no need for Python code. There's no need MATLAB. We are as good as the state of the art when you use LSTM using Python code. The accuracy level we're getting is the same as the top notch algorithm using only hardware and with very few neurons. Like if you look at the, it, yeah, you expect as you add more MIMS, your accuracy is getting better. But the key message here, we are as good as a state of art machine learning, algorithm such as the LSTM. The accuracy level you can get from this MEMS hardware is as good as a state of the art machine learning for this application where you have multi events, not only sit to stand, you have standing, you have walking, you have jumping. So we demonstrate with as few as 10 couples MEMS acceleration accelerometers we can do measuring of the acceleration, but at the same time, we can do machine learning. Can we do more? Yes. So we kind of took this more to show like this kind of, kind of architecture can be used for almost any application. So this is a robot application. So this is more involved uh, application because it has two things. Uh, so by the way, this is kind of textbook artificial intelligent application. 
So imagine this is a robot that needs to move to left or right and has at least seven sensors. Those sensors, they measure the angle for a falling object. And the falling object could be a, a square or could be a circle. So the, the thing I said, this is a complex application because first it required classification. From those sensor measurement, the angle they make with respect to the object, you need to decide if this is a square or triangle. If this is, or if this is a triangle or a circle. If this is a triangle, this means you wanna move away from it. If this is a circle, you wanna cut that circle. So you wanna design an algorithm where a machine learning network that does two things at the same time. Do the classification, but the more important part to do the best tracking, when I decide when the right time for the robot to be in the right place to catch a circle or fly away from the rectangle. So again, you can train a machine learning neural network to do, to do so. So what we show with those MEMS devices, the MEMS hardware, we can put the stack of those, we can train them using a typical machine, a typical training like a gradient basin uh, algorithm, to decide the weight between the MEMS, and you can do this, the whole thing using only MEMS. There's no need for microsoft, there's no need for DSP. Those MEMS, they can first classify if this is a square or a, a, a triangle falling object or a circle, and also they can guide the robot to be in, this, in the right spot to catch the object or to be away from that object. We demonstrate this, and we show as good as a typical machine learning we can do with only MEMS. We can do that with only means. So there's a lot more to it. There's a lot more to it, but just like briefly, I wanna summarize the whole thing. Usually I'll, I'll start with that slide and go back to that slide. So this is kind of the whole summary of my presentation. Far to the left is where the state of the art of means of the sensors, they separate them. The sensor are isolated. You know, like when people kind of try to deal with sensor, they deal with the sensor as, just give me the reading and then I'll do everything else after. And this is how it's been done so far. You measure acceleration, that will reduce a very low voltage signal. You wanna amplify it, you wanna make ADC to it, and then you wanna send it to a CPU to do the processing, to do machine learning. This is has what's been done in the literature. One step ahead, we design for the first time what we call a mechanical switch that will switch to be on if the acceleration exceeds the threshold. The problem with that is only based on the amplitude. What we can do more, my collaborator at the University of Dallas, Texas at Dallas, they said, okay, I can put those switches together and based on the value of the switches, because those are switch, zero, one, zero, zero, one. I can arrange them in a way their status will be the digital version of the acceleration. So I eliminate the need for the ADC. But the problem, I still want to send the CPU to do the processing. The talk today about a new approach where similar to those switch, but I do what we call full coupling. Those switches are fully coupled. And also I, I do some engineering for their response to match a machine learning equation. So now when those MIMS, when you apply an acceleration, I can train them to, do, to provide high level information. One example I didn't show here is fault detection, uh, elderly. This is a big topic, how we can design a machine learning that can decide if this is a real fault for elderly or not. So you can trigger an emergency service to come. There's a lot of potential with that. There's a lot of talk to use wobble device, but the major issue with that is this requires sophisticated algorithm. You wanna code in the, in the, in the wobble device, that's already suffering from the from the high need for power. This will will need to to you you need to charge the robot device more often. With this approach, now no, you put those capacitive MEMS device with the which they consume nanowatt. You engineer them, you train them, the coupling between them, so they can do the fault detection in the spot in the MEMS hardware. There's no need for DSP. There's no need for CPU. For the first time, we marrying the, the sensing with the computing and the physical layer. There's no need again, I repeat this for the 10th time maybe or more, there's no need for CPU. The MEMS mechanically, they can talk to each other and then they decide if this is a real fall or not. We can embed the computing in the mechanical response of the MEMS device. 
we can embed that in the MEMS device. So with that, I think I kind of captured the essence of this work. There's a lot of details. I try just give the, the kind of the, the brief, uh, quick description of this work. And with that, I'm open for questions. I'm open for questions. I go to the to the question slide here. Alexander has a question for you right now. I think his question is related um, more so is do you use TinyML in your project? Um, I, are you, I think Alexander might be referring to like um, TensorFlow. Yeah. Is TensorFlow, yes. how, is, how is that incorporated into your yeah. MEMS project? So Alex, yeah, it's a good question. So, you know, we, that's what I'm saying, I keep repeating here, we don't use any kind of form of computing. This is, that's the whole, the main thing here. Like our structure, our architecture is to eliminate the need for CPU. So there's no need for a microprocessor. We designed the MEMS, so I go to the first slide. So this is what's being done in the literature. You have a sensor, and that, that's a kind of the major bottleneck. You're separating the sensor from the machine learning. So you want to get the signal from the from the from the from the sensor. You want to send it to tiny ML to do the processing. So the separation. In our approach, we marry together. We have the sensor and the and the computing at the same level. So they kind of when the MEMS they vibrate to to respond to acceleration. They also do computing. We design them to do the, the to perform the machine learning equation at the spot. So there's no need for any microprocessor. All the application I demonstrated here, we're doing classification, we're doing the, the path planning, only using MEMS. There's no need for any tiny ML uh, processor to do the computing. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah. So uh, Hassan, Hassan uh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. Um, can we use more than three MEMS? Yes, Hassan. So that's a project we're doing now. We, are, we are, like, especially, like, I just I give you a hint here, as I was inclined here, Based on the coupling, so mechanical coupling, yeah, you could do five MEMS and then you saturate the space because you have to really have physical coupling between the MEMS. Uh, comb dry finger, you can do more, maybe 10, because you know there's no mechanical coupling, but it's all about how many fingers you can place in each of those MEMS. The potential is this, op amps, you know, charge op amps. You can do particularly maybe 30, 40, because there's no need to cover those mechanically or comb drive. You know, it's just like a small orb amps. And my understanding, orb amps, they can go now in the nanoscale, just few transistors. So you can scale, this is way like hundreds and even uh, bigger than that, yeah. So that's for Hassan, yeah. Can oh, MEMS, yeah, yeah, go oh, ahead. Yeah, they ask, can MEMS remember a state? You do not need to couple with DRM, DRAM yes. or MEMS? Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, I did. I, I went through this very quick. You know, the very, very good question, by the way. So the way I was, I skipped this very quickly, but when he said, I want to engineer the MEMS, we, we activate what we call bi-stability. We would name it as hysteresis with something bad. In our case, no, something we would love to have. So there's multiple ways to enable the, the memory or the hysteresis. One way, what we call a uh, uh, non-linear non kind of geometry. And one example is using what we call arch beam. So those arch beam, they have the memory. Like when you excite them, like they are curvature. And then you apply a voltage, they will buckle. And then guess what? You start reducing the voltage, it will keep the memory until the voltage go below where it brings it to the buckling point. And that's the memory. So yes, that's a very good question. I skipped this, I didn't talk much about it. I was, I was just saying in DJ the MEMS, but the but then. The, the engineering work to say engineering the memory is to activate the bi-stability, to activate the memory. One way is, is this arch beam. Other way, if you guys are familiar with the MEMS, there's something called pull in, pull out. There's a hysteresis, there's a memory, we, we utilize that. So yeah, we, we activate the memory status and the MEMS to achieve, to enable the computing. Very, very good question. Great, thanks. Um, Luis asks, are you saying that the MEMS do not need IC or ASIC? Can you please it, elaborate on MEMS it, and the ML on the same level? Exactly right. That's the, th the thing. If you look at the structure, which we use to do machine learning classification, there's no IC, there's nothing. It's just like pure MEMS, proof mass. They are, in this case, mechanical coupled. They are coupled mechanically. The only thing, the only requirement is a bias voltage just to get those working. Beside that, 
there's no time error, there's no ISIC, there's nothing. It just mechanically, when they when you apply the driving force is the acceleration. When you apply acceleration, those will move against each other. So we carefully designed that movement to do the machine learning. If that answer your question, Lewis. Yeah, this is exactly the, the main idea here. There's no need for ISIC, there's no need for like almost any nothing. The main requirement is just bias voltage to get those working. And the bias voltage, since those are capacitive device, it consumes nanowatt. Yep. Great. Um, Romaine asks, how do you compute the shape or strength of the connection between the MEMS for a given task slash classification? V very good question as well. Guess what? Bias voltage, the depict the bias voltage. Those MEMS are nonlinear. So even though you apply DC voltage, the way the DC voltage interact with the MEMS will produce the computing we want. So we can change the bias voltage. And actually, this is a very, very good question. We just about to publish this finding. I'll go back to this structure. So the same structure, by changing the bias voltage, we can do different problems. We can do the, the thing I talked about here to sit to stand. By changing the bias voltage, we can do the signal classification. So bias voltage is the, is the main idea. So uh, I'm going back in the top, this ball asking, can we get a written description if you work? Yes. Uh, in the slide, you know, I, I put some references like uh, hybrid. So if you click those, but also after the presentation, I can share with tiny uh, organization my recent publication about this topic, uh, of more information about this. Uh, Mark, do you have any real world application for network MIMS, especially in large number? Yes. Uh, we are funded by kind of classified, kind of uh, classified funding agency. And we're, we're really targeting big application, like really big application where we might need uh, more than those, um, huge number of those MIMS, and they're tackling very big application. You know, a typical application that you really need an intensive Python code to, to kind of to do it. And one thing I didn't mention here, those MIMS are still in the micro scale, but also there's a route where if you move those to the nano scale, like na na uh, nano micro metric system, also, this is other dimension. You can fit like hundreds or more of those in one in, in one centimeter cube. Yeah. Uh, Mark, again, would any area be able to perform computing your, with even lower power than transistor based? Yeah, that's the whole idea here. Those are capacitive device. And you know, as you guys know, capacitor, they consume way much less power. Yeah, they might have need more voltage, but the current is very small. And most of the time, you know, when you do the classification, the MIMS will sit ideal. It consumes nanowatt. So theoretically, they can perform computing with way much power. That's one thing. The other big thing, which I'm going back to the first slide, the other big thing, where, which is very big, by the way, we're eliminating the need for signal condition for my accelerometer. A typical accelerometer, you need to ADC it. You need to kind of convert the voltage to a, to a, a binary code that you can. So there's a lot of power waste there. We're eliminating that. So to be to make a fair comparison, so we are low power in the computing, but also we eliminate the overhead cost that you need to translate a voltage signal to accelerometer. We don't need to read the accelerometer no more. The 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 MEM cell they will read the acceleration between them and they do the computing at the spot. So aiming. I'm not understanding the, mem the memorization part clearly. Does MIMS need constant power bottom to maintain the number? No, they, they don't need that. You only need a bias voltage. The MIMS response will do the memory by itself. The, the, you know, the, the way we engineer the MIMS itself, this, this kind of structure, it has the memory built in, but we only need the bias voltage to activate the MIMS. The MIMS equation is complex. And again, people, they shy away from that complicity. They try to actuate it very slightly with a small voltage so it can stay in the linear regime. If you have increased that voltage, the MEMS has embedded hysteresis. It has embedded nonlinearity that we can capitalize to achieve the memory. So yeah, there's no need uh, uh, to sophisticate activa activations. It's only constant bias voltage that activate this complex dynamic. And then what come after is coming from the interaction between the MEMS. Is it specific for certain or is it generic? Very good question, uh, Safwan. As I mentioned before, we try to mimic what we call CTRNN, 
continuous time recurrent network. This one is very, very rich machine learning, but there's not much literature on it because the equation of each neural differential equation. Like me, guys, I don't like differential equation. And think about machine learning has, let's say, 20 neurons. It has all those differential equations. You have 20, like 20 by 20 different couple differential equations. Guess what? How much a digital computer would take time to solve it? Now, with this approach, we don't need that because the MIMS, when they move, they solve the equation. So that's the whole thing. So yeah, so far, we are, we are tracking, we, we targeting this architecture, which is, by the way, the most depth in depth machine learning equation, but people shy away from it. There's very few work in the literature, but that few work demonstrate it's powerful. As I mentioned before, those references are there. Only four of those neurons are able to classify this complex problem, where typical recurrent network need more than 128 to classify a similar problem. Why people they're not doing this? Repeating myself again and again, CTRN used differential equation to describe the neural equation. Nobody liked to solve differential equation using the digital computer. Mark, can a MIMS array perform machine learning inference faster? Yes. Theoretically, it should for one reason, because the, the sensing is done at the same level at the computing level. With typical MCU, there's a lag. You want to measure the, the accelerometer. You want to condition it, you want to sample it, you want to send it to the person to do it. Here, we're doing everything at the same spot. We're doing the acceleration, measurement, and the computer at the same level. <clears throat> Paul, are this covered in one dimension? Yep, very, very, yeah, you're reading my not, mind here, Paul. So far, we're doing 1D. The next level is one or two, do, like, you know, especially for active, active, activity recognition, you might need two dimension and even three dimension. So, so far, we demonstrate this in 1D. But the next thing, the same thing we can cover in 1D, we can cover in 2D, we can cover in 3D. That's kind of our future work, how to increase the accuracy of the algorithm, where you want to move, make the proof mass move in 2D or even 3D, doing sensing and computing at the same time. And there, we need, I need kind of collaboration. There, I'm looking for collaboration. My Our lab, uh, the, the best we can do is 1D. You know, we could do 2D, but 3D, other type of, like sensing. It's all we talk about, accelerometer. The same thing can apply in gyroscope. The same thing can apply for pressure sensor. So this idea can, can expand the board of different sensing applications. So far, the, the focus in 1D accelerometer. As I show here, as you mentioned here, Paul, you hint to, uh, an accelerometer can also, one single proof mass can be designed to sense acceleration X on Y and Z. The same approach can be done in that way. It would be more complex, but yeah, this can be doable. Um, can you repeat what you're looking for collaboration on? Yeah, so collaboration. First of all, as Paul hint here, can we do this in more than one D? You know, can we do it in two D? The other collaboration potential is: can we do it beside acceleration? Can we do it for gyroscope for rotation? Can we do it for pressure sensor? Can we do it for mass sensor? For different application, you know, uh, scaling. Can we scale this? You know, so far we've been demonstrating this with the three or four or five minutes. Mm. Can we scale it more? I have some other active project to scale it, but also can we scale it for different application? You know, those kind of the thing. I think there's a lot of work can be done in that regard. Application. You know, the thing I'm I care about is those simple application I'm talking about. Is there other application in the literature where people really they really need to do those machine learning with high speed and low power. Is there other application that we can target with this approach? Great, thank you. Well, it looks like we've answered all the questions. Um, looks like we have one more from Lewis. What type of MEMS did you use, consumer grade or industrial? Yes, very good question. So the ERA application we demonstrate, we use industrial grade accelerometer, like literally. literally we bought, we brought an accelerometer over the shelf. We break the, the packaging and we arrived to the proof mass and we do some uh, proof of concept. But so far, what we're doing, we fabricate our own MEMS, you know, just like a proof of concept using the University of Dallas, uh, uh, Texas at Dallas uh, clean room. So those are really fr fresh from the oven. You know, we, we designed those, 
lay out, send it to the university, and they do. Yeah, it's not industry grade, but those can, with collaboration, they can move to that direction. You know, just a proof concept where maybe after 20 or 100 cycles will fail, but just to prove the concept. But but yeah, there's other work where we can move this to the industry grade, where to make it kind of survive, uh, you know, harsh environment and other stuff. Great. Looks like Paul has a question. Um, the means of interconnecting the MEMS wasn't clear. Do they float on each other? What is the kind of interaction yeah. there? Yeah, so I'm back to this slide. I'm in the right side. So one way to do it is the, is the very obvious to understand the mechanical connection. So I think about, I'll use my laser pointer again. So just to be clear here. So this one proof mass that measure one acceleration, this other proof mass, oh, and this is the third proof mass. And you can see there's a mechanical stiffness that connect this proof mass with the other proof mass. The same thing, there's mechanical stiffness that connect this proof mass with the other proof mass. So think about if there's acceleration coming, let me just use color, draw. Yeah. So if there's acceleration coming this way, this proof mass will move and throw the stiffness will move this proof mass with it, as simple as that. And the weights, that as a typical Python code would translate to how stiff is that? You know, how stiff you want to be the coupling between this MEMS and that MEMS? And how stiff you want to coupling between this and that MEMS? So this is the easy to understand mechanical coupling, very straightforward, just like mechanical stiffness that connect the proof mass. And based on that stiffness, you can decide, decide the weights between the masses uh, when the when accessions are applied. The next coupling, is the, well, as I mentioned before, the comb drive. So again, think about, go back to the notation here. So think about this one proof mass, and there's a set of fingers, comb drive fingers. So those comb drive fingers will be activated from a voltage from MEMS2. And those set of comb fingers will from MEMS1, and those MEMS N. And we can design those comb drives. So when, once this activate, either to move this MEMS closer to a stop or away as a positive gain or negative gain. So literally this proof mass will be moving because of the applied acceleration. Also the feedback is getting from the other MEMS. So it's kind of, we call it hybrid, still like mechanical and also electrical. The, the very easy also to understand is the last one where you have as simple as you have op amp, that transfer charge between the MEMS. At the price you pay here, you need more, little bit more voltage to, up, to, to run those op amps. But again, there's no need for this signal condition to get the acceleration measurement. It's just an op amp to transfer the voltage from MEMS to other MEMS, if that makes sense. Does that answer your question, Mark? Great. Thank you so much. Looks like we, if anybody has any last few questions they want to ask, then we'll get those answered. <clears throat> you can also ask questions on the forum page and we'll send those over to Dr. Austin Lemus for him to answer as well. And Paul just says, great work, great, great research. He wants to hear more. So people, re people will reach out. But anyways, um, thank you everybody. And thank you, Dr. Al-Saleem for the great talk. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, again, we'd like to thank our TinyML strategic partners for committing to take TinyML to the next level together. Um, we'd like to thank our executive strategic partners, ARM AI, the latest in AI trends, technologies, and best practices from ARM and our ecosystem partners. Edge Impulse, the leading edge ML platform. Qualcomm, advancing AI research to make efficient AI ubiquitous. Sentient, end-to-end -end deep learning solutions for tiny ML and edge AI. Our platinum strategic partners, DeepLight, the fastest video analy analytic solutions on ARM CPUs. Plicatech, global IoT solutions. Reality AI, pre-built edge AI sentient modules plus tools to build your own. Broad and scalable edge computing portfolio, portfolio from Renesas. 
our gold strategic partners. Photo Hub, Maxim Integrated, Latent AI, NXP, Seed Studio, Sensi ML, ST, Sinsense, and our silver, silver strategic partners, Aeon Devices, Emza Visual Sense, Green Waves Technologies, Gravity Inc., HOTG, Image Mob, Itemis, Prophecy, Kikso, Reeksin, SAP, and Stream Analyze. Our next TinyML talk is on Friday, July 3rd with Peter Ng of talking about the TinyML South Africa Meetup Kickoff 2022. Please contact talks at tinyml.org if you're interested in presenting. Thank you, thank you everyone for joining and have a great afternoon or morning or evening, wherever you are. And thank you, Dr. Alsaline for the great talk. Thank you, I appreciate that, thank you.